Daniel Den Hollander, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, my name is Daniel Den Hollander. I'm a clinical psychologist. I um, have worked 10 years in public service. I used to work, uh, I was trained up in uh, KwaZulu Natal at the uh, University of KZN um, and then um, did about 10 years of work in the Northern Cape. Um, we set up I did, uh, we actually were responsible for two um, hospitals in the department that I was working at. So I've got a good um, history in regards to general hospitals. Um, and we worked in the tertiary level. So I've got a little bit of um, um, experience with psoriasis in regards with um, the dermatology clinic that referred to us there. Um, although um, at this point in time, I do a lot more sort of specialist. Uh, mental health care work. Um, I'm also a bit of an addiction specialist and uh, um, at the moment uh, made the decision to go into private practice, um, mainly because I realized that you can actually do more community work from a private practice perspective than from a, uh, from a public health, um, and which was for me something that I didn't even realize until I, I fully um, had to uh, as a result of COVID. Um, I think the, the, the other part of, of, of my work is that I'm an advocate for um, mental health, or should I say I advocate for mental health. I, at the moment, chair the psychologist professionals in public service division for CISA, um, but I also do um, work um, at, at the moment. I'm uh, also, Aunt Agony on SAFM, uh, that sort of happened by accident, but uh, also just another platform in regards to promoting mental health needs, with, especially within our South African context. I'm currently based in Paul in the Western Cape. Um, I don't know if there's uh, people from the Western Cape in the audience. I'm, I'm, I'm almost pretty sure that uh, most of you are. Um, I know that. Uh, um, the invitation came from Kutuski, and, and, and I just also want to acknowledge that and say thank you very much in regards to that. Um, so when I was Googling a little bit about what to talk about today, because uh, I think the most important thing is to have a relevant conversation, is um, I had a look a bit about the relationship between uh, psoriasis and, and psychology. I'm sure that you probably had presentations along the same sort of lines before. Um, that we know with psoriasis, there's a, that there's the issue around, or there's a high level of a lack of body awareness um, that comes a lot in regards to stigmatization and, and shame that, that sometimes is accompanied with stigmatization. Um, there's also a link around alcoholism, which is about the idea of disconnecting with yourself. Um, and also, I mean, that's how I know it is, is that um, I'm often asked to help with daily stresses because there's um, and a knowledge that daily stresses influences disease outcome. But then if we're talking about those types of things in my world, that then we're talking about things like stresses, um, anxiety. If we're talking about stress and anxiety, then we're immediately talking about boundaries and assertiveness. Um, but then we're also talking about stigmatization. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus primarily on stigmatization. But I'm also interested in sometimes what happens is that we we buy into the stigmatization that comes towards us. Um, and it's that we, we can even start to, to um, take it on as part of our identity, that we become stigmatized individuals. And, um, and that itself can become such a stressor. And that's what I want to try and unpack with you today is, um, it sounds like such a psychology term, hey, unpacking, but uh, to look at stigmatization and look at stresses and how the two play into each other. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be uh, proper if I explained it, but didn't talk about how to, um, some strategies in regards to bringing that back out again um, so that you left with, with, with an answer rather than a better formulation of the difficulties. Um, I've, I've never found that very useful. Um, it's good to have an answer at the end. So um, looking at stigmatization, um, and this is um, in regards to any type of stigmatization that takes place, is that we know the stigmatization affects you on four levels in the way that how you can have relationships with somebody that you that you don't um, haven't met before who doesn't know you 
Um, you can become incredibly self-conscious in regards to somebody who's not aware of, of the symptoms, um, who's going to have all sorts of ideas and preconceived ideas of you, causes difficulties with social life. Um, we also know that people are incredibly prejudiced um, if they like it or, or, or not. Um, and as a result, prejudice often sneaks in into job opportunities. And there's a huge link between stigmatization and employment possibilities. Or you yourself might not feel adequate enough um, in, in regards to, to things that are actually not holding you back um, from a work perspective, but might hold you back on a social perspective. So then all of a sudden, stigmatization can affect your abilities or possibilities for employment. And then lastly, we're looking also at leisure activities, you know, that you, you feel that you need to take more precautions than necessary in order to deal with other people's um, social acceptance or social understanding. Um, and so it can impact your life in regards to leisure activities. So those four areas generally is where stigmatization um, starts to impact. And the point is with stigmatization is that stigmatization is nothing else than just pure discrimination, meaning the stigmatization is not the fault of the person who's being stigmatized against, it's the fault of the community or of the people around you that are doing the stigmatizing. Um, and this is, the, this is what is so dangerous about this, is that what happens is the, non, the, 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 the illness or the condition um, of prejudice um, is not being treated. Um, and as a result of that, the effect of that comes onto the person who's being stigmatized against. And um, often when that happens, a person does one of two things. They either accept it or they fight it. But often what we do is we accept it. And so we play the stigmatization or we play the roles um, that uh, the stigmatization is doing towards us. And if we do that, that is the hallmark of creating things like anxiety, depression, um, where it becomes more severe mental health conditions, which makes sense. Because when I have to buy on other people's prejudice onto myself, and I define myself by the words and by the terms that other people use for me, it's going to have an impact on how I do things. And uh, if that's prolonged, because with any chronic condition, the whole point is that this is something that I have to learn to live with. But if, they, if, if, if society creates a label of shame on me due to my chronic condition, then immediately from that, if the condition is lifelong and I don't change the stigmatization, then the stigma is lifelong. And that's what creates um, quite severe mental health pictures later on. Uh, and especially um, with uh, sorry, uh, psoriasis is, is that um, that actually exasperates the symptoms and makes it worse. And then it just becomes a downward spiral um, that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know about um, and that you're aware of. I want to sp spin a little bit from here towards stress. Because I think, you know, we often, what we do as stress is we thought stress is a possibly a good thing, but mainly not a good thing. Um, if you've got a mental illness, then that's not, a, that's really not a good thing. Um, and uh, we don't really understand what to do with stress. And then you go to a, a person like myself, and then we usually get a referral that says that we must teach you a few coping skills. I've always found that a bit of an insult to the clients in front of me if I've got to teach you coping skills because I'm, I can only to teach you coping skills that applies to Daniel. Um, I'm not so good at teaching you how to do coping skills for yourself because every human being copes with life situations differently. There's a few things that we do together that, 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 that might be helpful. But I think you know what's much more important than teaching someone coping skills is to empower someone that you don't have to take on the narratives that other people throw at you. You don't have to take on the stigmas that other people throw on you. Um, and that becomes very important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And I think stress is one of these things. 
Um, you know, I often have people that come into the practice that talk about having a, um, a nervous breakdown as if this is a concept that exists in psychology. It, it actually doesn't. There's no such diagnosis as a nervous breakdown. But what it is, is that your system can only tolerate a certain amount of stress. And if it goes over that stress level, then your system literally just says, uh -uh, shut down, thank you. Um, the same thing happens with your phone or your tablet. If they get too hot, then suddenly they just turn off. That is literally what a nervous breakdown is, is your system saying to you, uh -uh, enough, we need to take the stress levels down. And that creates a different understanding around concepts like stress into your life. You're going to see why I'm going into stress now and where it comes in. It'll make sense in a second. But one of the most important things around stress is that stress, um, when a person comes in and feels stress, especially stress on, an, on, on a social level or on an emotional level, it's usually around sensitivity. I feel things more than other people feel things and we know that this is true we know that certain people have relations and thank goodness because i think we need all um, sorts of people in order for this world to 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 exist and uh, all the skill levels that we've got but often what happens is sensitivity is seen as vulnerability now, I want to immediately explain why these two words are not the same and why this is important for you. So I remember recently um, I was invited to a, a high tea at, um, I think it's called the one and only at the, um, at, uh, the waterfront. And um, when I was there, there was this beautiful grand piano um, in the middle of, 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 of the foyer. And um, a, 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 a rather large looking and, and quite a, a, a strong looking guy um, entered the room and I was trying to work out where he goes because in that place everybody's dressed to the T and as I'm seeing him sitting there um, he immediately goes to the piano and uh, rolls up his um, jacket sleeves and starts to play. Now this guy was incredible to listen to his hands literally danced over the keyboards and the amount of what came out of there the music that came out of there was so beautiful and so sensitive in its delivery um, his fingers literally danced over the keyboards and in that moment I, I found myself losing myself to what he was playing with it was becoming very distracting in regards to the conversations because my mind just veered towards the sensitivity and what he was able to elicit with me um, on that very deep emotional level and i know that that kind of sensitivity that comes out comes because he's in touch with how he is and how he feels and 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 and, and the beautiful things of, of of life you know artists are so good at that is being in touch with their emotions and being able to communicate it to to other people but when he finished I looked at him I mean, I, I wanted to talk to him and say thank you for playing but to be honest I felt a bit intimidated because he was definitely not a vulnerable person he was big he was tall and he had a presence around him and so in that in, in that light I almost felt like there was a contradiction he's sensitive but he's not vulnerable but I think the important thing here is is that it isn't a contradiction because sensitivity and vulnerability are not the same thing. And so it also is when we become sensitive of how other people perceive us, or if we become sensitive to the way in which we are dealing with stresses in our lives. I think specifically with the lockdown and COVID, I think a lot of us actually suddenly realized we might be workaholics and that our life work balance has not been right even before uh, COVID and, and, and lockdown. And we've been working under conditions that were actually not correct. And I think that there's a real importance about the fact that that initial lockdown period, a lot of people actually found themselves feeling happier. A lot of people started to spend more time at home, had more family time. I remember that there was a bit of a resurgence of information or, or, or research around that time 
that the balance had create uh, had had been restored in in certain households, and um, I think we've been living in unhealthy um, environments for a little bit too long, without really realizing it. And I think it's because humans are very good at adapting. So the question comes in: Is that why? You see, th th this is where it becomes beautiful because no human being should be under immense stress for a long period of time. And it's not as if because you have a chronic condition, therefore, all of a sudden, you cannot handle stress. It just means that maybe the environments in which we've been living in haven't been as healthy as we thought they were. It's been also quite cool to see that a lot of companies, not all companies, may I say, but a lot of companies took a bigger interest into the mental health needs of their employees as soon as COVID hits. And they started to realize that the problems that they had around productivity was actually about neglecting their workforce beforehand rather than neglecting the workforce during COVID. So COVID actually allowed us to become more aware of our mental health needs. I'm excited to see what that's going to do later. But I want to say that especially when you're suffering from a, a chronic condition that requires you to become more proactive around stress, there's an opportunity to become sensitive towards stress and to learn not to take on stress in your environment as much as it would be if you didn't have that condition. And there immediately comes a shift between being vulnerable towards being sensitive. In other words, that we learn that our stresses and our anxiety are actually ways of us communicating to ourselves that we are not able to take this workload on, or we are not able to um, work under conditions that are actually inhumane. It's amazing how we allow ourselves to do it anyway. Um, I know that there are a few nursing staff and, and doctors in the audience but I want to say a good instigation of that is, for example, the pressure that is put onto us with things like PMDS forms. Now, the whole point of a PMDS, the performance management uh, forms, is you must um, have high numbers. And if you get high numbers, um, then you get bonuses, which equate to probably about 50 rand an hour if you're lucky. Um, complete incentives have got no understanding to anything else. But what it does is it tries to manipulate anxiety as a motivator. You know, have you done your job? Have you got everything in place? How is it, how is it going on? Um, whereas we know that the majority of people who fill out the PMDS forms usually give themselves 100%. They just qualify for the basics. It's a one hour um, um, exercise. Um, and uh, we get what we get um, without the need of, of worrying about bonuses. Because anxiety can work as a motivator, but too much anxiety overwhelms. And the majority of us are not motivated by anxiety. We're motivated by things like purpose, like direction, like family, or just simply to be able to put uh, money on the, on, uh, or food on, uh, on the table. And so as a result of that, how we relate to anxi our anxiety, how we understand our anxiety, can help us to put the boundaries in place. We don't have to overwork if it's not making sense to us to do so. Um, we don't have to take on other people's workloads if it's not in our job description. These boundaries are vitally important because if we don't put these boundaries in place, we're not listening to our systems. Okay. I'm going to put this in. I, I know that there was one more point and I'm going to just make reference to it here is um, there's a brilliant book by the, uh, by the writer Robert Sapolsky called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. So he's a, um, an, a, a neurologist professor at Stanford University. And he says the reason why zebras don't get ulcers is because there's only two animals that get ulcers. And the two animals that get ulcers are humans and pets. And the only reason that humans and pets get ulcers and the other animals don't get ulcers is because when your dog is excited, we tell him to sit down or stay put. When anxiety requires us to take action, to run, to change our, our environments, to change our lifestyles. 
Um, and um, Sapolsky's book, and he stipulates it so beautifully in, in his book, is the idea that we drive our societies on the basis of anxiety as the motivator. And we need to really look at this uh, because this is causing a hell of a lot of, of pathology, uh, mental health pathology, but also cardiovascular pathology and other conditions as well. And it comes down to just balance. I need to stipulate all of this in order for you to understand how stress can be a helpful um, energy and an unhelpful energy or response, if you like, in the body. And now to start to bring that into stigmatization. So if we don't challenge the environment, then we don't create healthier spaces. And if we, sorry for the typo, if we villainize the individual suffering, then we attach the blame that belongs actually to the environments, we attach that onto the individual. So in other words, if you say, um, I'm not being able to handle this workload, or I'm not able to handle what's happening within my environments. And if I start to say that, and I start to believe that, um, which is true, and my environment says to me, yeah, but this is because you've got a chronic condition. Um, then they're saying that the only reason why I'm reacting badly to the stresses is because of my uh, chronic condition, not because the environment is unhealthy. And as a result of that, they then victim blame me as being a weak or vulnerable individual when I'm actually being sensitive to the fact that this is actually not healthy for anybody. All that blame then lands onto me. I'm the one who can't. I'm the one who's unable to. And what happens then is that I leave that experience with a sense of shame. And this is the important link because when I then incorporate that shame, and it's almost impossible not to when it initially is thrust onto you, is that when I incorporate that shame, remember that that shame was given to me. We're not born shameful. So that shame is put onto me. If I hold that shame and if, if I internalize that shame, then immediately there's a link between shame and feeling inferior. When I feel inferior, then I am disempowered. And that plays into the way that I relate in, on social level. That's the way that I relate at workplace. That's how I relate to anybody. That link is important for you to see. And we know specifically with shame is that shame has a specific context, context within our South African history because we know, especially in South Africa, how dangerous prejudice is, especially if it becomes structural because it starts to erode away our ability to challenge the powers that be. And also it starts to challenge the way um, that we start to talk about ourselves. Um, I'm going to go into that a little bit later, but I mean, in a nutshell, that's exactly what the previous system was, a, a means of shaming you on things that are actually not in your control. And instead of trying to understand you and your circumstances, which should give you, which would then empower you and give you the freedom that you need, it does exactly the opposite. It creates a superficial inferiority, superiority complex and holds you under that, that spell or that halt. And that is what then creates, because that's not a natural space for anybody to be in. If you don't believe me, um, think, try and hold, or if, if I can ask you as an experiment, it's just to clinch your fist as tight as you can. And uh, if you do it properly, you can already feel that your body wants to relax it. But if you can hold it straight like that, you can already start to feel that there's stress starting to culminate um, in your arm, in your, um, in your elbow, into, and before long, you're going to even start to feel it in your shoulders and your back. Now that stressor, if I say to you, you've got to hold that stressor for, let's say, the next hour, all of a sudden, you're going to start to have all sorts of other pains in your body that are related to this one stress. And what can have, even happen is that you let go of that. So that stress is gone. And about three hours later, you're going to complain that you've got um, shoulder pain and not realize where it comes from. Now, where does it come from? It comes from 
the fact that this was holding and so therefore everything else was compensating for that tension and that's exactly what also happens when we're holding other people's stresses and other people's problems is is that say for example something like shame is is that then shame starts to filter into all other areas of the life and it can even get to the point where the initial shame is resolved you know now suddenly um, people are aware and um, um, and destigmatize um, psoriasis but still shame has become part of your everyday life because you've been doing it for 10 to 20 years and so that shame then becomes a part of you um, that actually never belonged to you so you can see also how that creates onto the identity you've got two options the one is to hold the shame to become to conform to it often that creates um, situations where i become very apologetic um, I can even start to form codependent relationships if I feel that there's, um, if I've, I'm a beautifully, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, extroverted individual who loves to, to talk to people and is very socially engaging, but I realize that through the symptoms, I now find it very difficult and I'm very aware of it then I suddenly don't want to have those uh, jobs anymore. And I don't want to be exposed to that because that now becomes a moment of high anxiety. And I can even start to think that I might be more introverted than I even realize and start to close and withdraw um, and even start to look at other people to be able to do those jobs for me because it then takes me out of that, out of that moment. And then I form a codependent relationship. In other words, a relationship um, that says that I cannot without. And that becomes very, very dangerous because a codependent relationship means I'm dependent on somebody else and I cannot function on my own, which immediately again puts you in a disempowered state. Um, the idea of not being good enough, um, I think that that kind of speaks for itself. And the fact that not good enough often comes from the fact that it impacts on our self-esteem and our self-confidence. I can also choose to fight it. I can get onto Instagram all the time and start to um, talk about um, the, 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 the prejudice that comes out, um, the fight it. Um, but if we do not have a collective fight in regards to these types of things, I can really feel like I'm just one voice in a million. I, become, I can start to feel very frustrated. I can start to feel very cynical about the people around me. Um, I can start to feel disintegrated or disengaged with the people as it feels that this is one big losing battle. Now, I said to you, I was going to talk about solution, not um, um, just making the, the, the problem more clear. Um, because I'm sure that I'm preaching to the converted in regards to these types of of things. Um, hopefully it's been useful to formulate where stigmatization comes from and how it plays into identity. But uh, I think now is the time to switch over and to start talking about how to bring in um, the healing factor. The first answer is you do not have to own other people's prejudice. It's their, it's their illness, not yours. And another person's illness, they are responsible to change it. I want to really also say is, is that I think part of the solution is not to try and um, change the minds of people that are stuck on their ideas. I think that's why, you know, we um, teach people in psychology that one of the main rules about life or one of the main universals about life is that not everybody you meet is going to be healthy. And is going to not everybody you meet you have to be friends with or have to like and not every person you meet you have to have a meaningful relationship with um, and that there are going to be people out there that are not going to like you and there's going to be people out there that you're not even going to like and that's okay there's no uh, rule that says you have to be friends with everybody and as a result of that um, I think it's also important to put boundaries in place. If a person is somebody who's not a good support structure, and that includes family, um, have a barrier with them and be careful in regards to that. Because 
unfortunately, when you put a rotten potato in a potato bag, the healthy potatoes are not going to make the rotten potato any more healthy. And uh, unfortunately, that's where it's at. I want to say, you know, um, ignorance is, is um, you know, we, we can't uh, blame people for being ignorant, but we can blame people for staying ignorant. And that's a very important uh, change to make. So in that case is the important thing is to beat stigmatization requires a social answer. Now, I'm in many fields that um, end up being very stigmatized, um, specifically none more so than mental health. There's a lot of uh, stigmatization that takes place in mental health. Um, I remember even for professionals working in mental health, sometimes we just say that we work somewhere else just not to get the barrage of nonsense questions that we get on a daily basis. Um, I used to work in a specialized mental health hospital and people would always ask me, um, is it a mole haze? You know, you get words like that. Uh, and, and I think to myself, uh, um, you know, at, at which point, I mean, what, what kind of movies are you watching? I mean, even the movies have moved on in regards to these types of questions. You know, we're talking Hitchcock 70s, you know, um, and a total lack of understanding. We know, for example, that um, that stigmatization often stops people from getting the help that they need because they feel that if they go looking for help, then the label comes on them. Um, and I, I know that that's the, the same that happens within the dermatology clinics as well. And so you come really late into, into it um, where the chance for changes um, becomes quite late. And, um, and, and then unfortunately more severe types of pathologies come into play. But the most important thing is to find your social support structures. And um, I think to an extent, and I, I love initiatives like this, and uh, I always try and support because I think these kind of initiatives play a very important role of creating awareness, normalizing these things. You're not your condition. Um, you're a human being that's got so much to offer to the world and to give to the world who just happens to be having a condition, um, probably one of you know, I mean, name me a human being that's not suffering from at least two or three conditions in a lifetime. Um, and this just happens to be a chronic one, which requires you to make lifestyle changes. And, and, and that's about as far as it goes. And yet it becomes all this extra more. So social problem requires a collective answer. And we require people to start to normalize and realize that the human being is the most important part out of anything that we're dealing with. Um, not the condition or not even the prejudice around the conditions. Um, and often when we get the human being right, we've already answered seven or eight of the big important steps um, in regards to, 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 to resolving the issues that makes adherence to medication or creates um, the difficulties around being able to leave, live a much more peaceful, happy, balanced lifestyle. Um, so yeah, so that is a social problem requires a collective answer. But I think also secondly is sometimes, and, and we've got to be honest with ourselves around this, is sometimes we allow the stigmas and um, the hurtfulness of the stigmas to stick with us. And as a result of that, we start to even believe that it's a part of our life. Um, we even allow ourselves to believe it, to become shameful, to become embarrassed, um, to become um, feeling inferior because we have a condition. And I want to say, you know, the one really awesome thing about being South African is that in South Africa, we have South African answers. And I think we lead the world when it comes to questions around identity and empowerment. We just don't realize it because the world leaders, unfortunately, at your bargain books, um, bookstores, where they should be um, on our bookshelves and um, in our classrooms and so forth. Um, and I'm talking, I'm going to use something because we as a country suffered from a huge inferiority, superiority complex. I mean, that's just one way of calling it. Um, I think it's a lot more than that. But at the base, had this idea of 
people uh, being prejudiced towards other people on things as benign as the diversity that we have as people. Um, and I'm talking about apartheid and I'm talking about um, the social injustices that took place as a result of that. Um, what's genius is that the answers towards how to empower yourself in a disempowering environment is what we still have at our disposal in uh, 2021. Um, and I mean, uh, I'm going to base it a little bit on the work of Steve Biko, but Steve Biko gives the most beautiful answer in regards to how to deal with prejudice on an individual basis. So I'm going to give you the quotes and then we're going to work through the quotes and then we'll, and, and then I think by that stage we'll be ready for some questions and answers. So um, this is the quote from Steve Biko. He says, it becomes more necessary to see the truth as it is if you realize that the only vehicle for change are these people who have lost their personality. The first step, therefore, is to make, and here I want to say that Mbiko is very strong on this, was that the, the term black used here is meant from a disempowered state to an empowered state, not in regards to, to, to um, our, our racial identity. So he means in this quote, anybody who feels disempowered, which I believe uh, somebody who's being stigmatized against is. It's a disempowering moment. So put yourself in there um, is what I'm saying. So the first step therefore is to make yourself come to yourself. We'll talk a bit about, we're gonna go step by step now. To pump back life into your empty shell, to infuse yourself with pride and dignity, and then to remind yourself of the complicity in the crime of allowing yourself to be misused and therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of your birth. That is what we mean by an inward looking process as the definition of, definition of black consciousness. Now I'll explain now how this applies. So when we say this, we say it becomes more necessary to see the truth as it is if you realize that the only vehicle for change are these people who have lost their personality. Now, the thing about stigmatization is if we can realize the stigmatization belongs to the prejudice of the powers that, are, that be that are away from us, it means we don't have to take that stigmas on. They don't belong to us because it's not our stuff to begin with. That includes shame. Shame doesn't belong to you. Shame belongs to the, to, to the, to, it's, it's a, a repercussion of the effect from them, not from yourself. And therefore you don't have to own it. It doesn't have to be yours. And the problem is, is if you live a life of shame, then you actually lose your personality because shame will take on your personality. And so, the, and, and unfortunately, no matter how much social activism that does take place, the only way that you will regain your um, own identity is if you are able to find back your personality. So you are the vehicle for change there. Now that's a really important thing because that means that you don't need other people in order for you to be empowered. It is important sometimes to get help. Um, uh, for example, um, I mean, I don't know if I'm now blatantly self-promoting here, but I mean, if, if you realize that there are difficulties in finding your personality or finding your identity, you know, I mean, that's why psychologists as a profession and, and uh, why I'm still in business uh, because this is an ongoing need. Um, so there is the case of professional help in regards to that. Um, and also to say that just because you need a psychologist doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Um, I think to an extent, every psychologist themselves is in, in therapy at, at some time in their life, especially on this point, and we need to normalize that as well. So the, the only vehicle for change, the only way for you to empower yourself is you who has lost your personality. Now how? The first step is to make yourself come to yourself. And that requires a deep appreciation of how amazing your system has been. I know that's sometimes difficult to do when you feel that your body's betrayed you with a condition. But I wanna say in that light is that your body holds so much for you during the day. You might now, as you're sitting here, start to feel your neck getting a bit sore 
or your shoulders feeling a bit sore. And a lot of that is the appreciation of what your body has to carry you through, through the day. And often what we do is we forget to be kind to ourselves, even though we've helped ourselves. And so it's so important for us to come back to ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, to take care of ourselves, and to realize that our bodies have done so much for us, especially also when we have a condition, your anxiety constantly making you aware of where your limits are, to try and, and, and limit the amounts. And it's when we don't listen to our anxiety that we're often in big trouble. Um, but more things along the lines of uh, learning to eat healthy and, and be kind to your body in, a health, in, 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 in what we eat, um, not giving ourselves substances that um, does damage to our bodies and to be connected with ourselves. The second one is to pump back energy into our empty shells. And this is very important because this means I need to do things that give me energy. Now, for myself, I know that the thing that gives me energy more than anything else would be either um, trying to make a change in the world in, in regards to the things that are happening that really does give me energy. For example, having a chat with, the, with, with you today on this forum gives me a lot of energy because it feels really like I'm doing something um, that um, is dealing with the frustrations that I have with the society out there. But it's also other things as well is I love music. Um, it's my big passion. It's, it's my big enjoyment. And I love making music. And I notice that when I go a month without making music, then I'm empty in a very different way. And it's important to pump back life into your empty shell, to do things that give you a passion, that give you enjoyment, that give you life. And then to infuse yourself with pride and dignity. And this is exactly the opposite of what shame does. Now, the important word here is infuse. You see, when we often think of these things, we think of them like weaving. But when you weave, you can still see the separate pieces um, in the weave. You can still see the separate threads. In infusing, you're melting the, the metal. And then you're allowing it to set. And when it sets, you don't know where the one ends and the other begins. And that is what we need to do with pride and dignity. It needs to become so a part of ourselves that when somebody is prejudiced towards us, it should be shocking to us. Hold on a second. Where is this coming from? What is this about? And that is about being able to have the support structures in place and to be able to build up the, and become very, um, what's the word, um, selective over the words that we use towards ourselves. Now, once all three of those things are put into place, and can you see that all three of those are about uplifting, empowering, giving ourselves the energy, okay? coming to ourselves, pumping back life, and then infusing ourselves with pride and dignity. Once those three things are in place, then we need to do the fourth step, which is to remind ourselves of the complicity now, complicity is our own role. So our, to remind ourselves of the, our own role in the crime of allowing ourselves to be misused. In other words, remember, this is Steve Biko. Steve Biko's other famous quote is, the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. In other words, don't let somebody else define how you see yourself and how you think. And that in this is so important because... This is about not allowing ourselves to be beaten up by another person's uh, prejudice sticks. And, um, and to, 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 to in that moment realize and forgive ourselves for the fact of allowing ourselves to continue this. Now, here's the important part is I'm not contradicting myself here, but in the sense of when the initial shame happens, that shame belongs to somebody else. It's not ours. Therefore, it's actually quite possible for us to give it back. But when we learn to hold the shame, that holding is what we need to forgive ourselves for and then give it back. And that's important because the moment that I forgive myself for holding it for the period of time that I do, 
it means that I know that this is no longer acceptable for me and my identity. And that's where the true empowerment comes in. And then he ends up with, this is what we mean by an inward looking process. Um, and they're here again, I think we, we can just say, this is what we mean by empowerment. Uh, 